Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the antivirals here, and we're going to go over sort of a, uh, a disease-focused approach, uh, simply because there's not a whole lot of viral diseases that are treated. Things like the common cold are not treated, for instance. So these are the viral diseases that warrant treatment. Okay, so we're going to talk about antivirals for influenza and for herpes viruses. Uh, namely chickenpox, herpes zoster, and, uh, and uh, actual genital herpes, uh, and CMV. And we're going to talk about, uh, actually we're not going to talk about antivirals for HIV and AIDS. That we discussed in another section. Uh, antivirals for HPV and molluscum contagiosum. We're going to talk about the antivirals for hep B and then the antivirals for hep C. So, treating influenza. What is influenza? It is a common systemic disorder, particularly involving the upper respiratory tract. So we've all had the flu before, we know how it feels. It's a cough, runny nose, you feel achy, you feel painy, you got that frontal orbital headache, and you're tired, and usually you're running a fever. Generally, the USMLE is going to want you to differentiate this from strep throat because strep throat also has rhinorrhea. You can also have myalgia and some sinus pressure and fatigue and high fever. What you're not going to have in strep throat is a cough. What you will have in strep throat is the uh, pharyngeal exudates. As far as diagnosing influenza, first we should make sure that those myalgias are not meningismus. If the patient has any Kernigs or Brudzinski signs, then we should immediately get a lumbar puncture. Uh, of course, seeing that the patient does not have an elevated intracranial pressure. The rapid check assay is the best first diagnostic step when we suspect influenza, and it's also the most accurate test that we have on hand. If the diagnosis is made within 48 hours, now this is crucial, you're going to check the patient for influenza. You're also going to ask them, when did the symptoms come on? If it was less than 48 hours ago, then you're going to treat them with an antiviral. If it was not, if it was more than two days ago, then you're just going to give them supportive care. The fact is that if we treat with an antiviral within 48 hours, we will shorten the course of the disease by about a day or two. If it's more than two days after the onset of symptoms, then the antiviral is not really going to do any good. So the two drugs that we have for influenza are oseltamivir, which is a PO formulation, and zanamivir, which is an inhaled compound. Amantadine used to be used. It is now no longer used for influenza. So oseltamivir and zanamivir. The adverse effects are sparse, but zanamivir can cause bronchospasm because it's an inhaled compound, so you really shouldn't give this to patients who have asthma. Oseltamivir, I think, is much more commonly prescribed anyway. But either of these are appropriate answers on the USMLE. And a way you can remember that these are the drugs given for influenza is the I before the vir, so influenza virus. How about treating herpes virus infections? So we got a lot of different infections that are classified under quote unquote herpes virus. One of them would be varicella zoster, which is chicken pox. Another is herpes zoster, which is shingles. Chicken pox and shingles can both be treated with acyclovir. Acyclovir does not, however, uh, treat CMV. Cytomegalovirus mu must be treated with either gancyclovir or valgancyclovir or foscarnet. You cannot use acyclovir. So Gansiclovir is going to be your initial drug of choice for CMV infections. Really, gansiclovir or valgansiclovir will be your initial drug of choice for CMV infections. Gansiclovir is also used and indicated for CMV prophylaxis in HIV and AIDS patients with low CD4 counts. The common adverse effect that you should know for the USMLE with gansiclovir is pancytopenia. Valgansiclovir is just a prodrug of gansiclovir, so they really just do the same thing. Now what Foscarnet is, is it's sort of our second line drug for CMV. 
It has a wider spectrum of activity and it's a little bit stronger and it's reserved for the protracted CMV infections in immunocompromised patients. The reason we try to avoid using foscarnet is because it is nephrotoxic and because it can cause electrolyte disturbances and so it needs to be used in an inpatient setting. So gancyclovir is your initial drug of choice for CMV infections. Acyclovir can be used for for chicken pox or shingles, but you cannot use it for CMV. And I had a resident that told me, oh shit, I have herpes. And so you got the O before the vir on all the herpes virus drugs, except for Foscarna. Okay, HIV and AIDS was covered in that section, so consult that. How about for treating HPV, human papillomavirus and molluscum contagiosum? Molluscum contagiosum is really just, it's caused by the same thing. It's just, uh, it's just on the skin rather than on the genitals. Uh, the therapy is topical here, so we don't use, uh, we don't use systemic therapy. Or at least uh, I haven't, I've never seen it used uh, and I've never seen it in any board reviews. So we use amiquimod and podophyllin. Both of these are topical, and because they're topical, the adverse effects are primarily skin. So dermatitis at the site of application. Podophyllin can have systemic side effects, but they're extremely rare. So you should know that amiquimod and podophyllin, the adverse effects are primarily just dermatitis at the site of application. As far as treating HPV, uh, or treating genital warts and molluscum contagiosum, usually surgical therapy plays a, a role too. So cryotherapy, surgical excision, and so forth. So when it comes to treating hepatitis B, one thing that's worth remembering, and I probably mentioned this in the GI hepatitis section, hopefully, uh, but hepatitis B is one of the few viruses that affect human beings that, is, uh, that uses reverse transcriptase. So the other one, of course, being HIV. So what that means is that uh, some of the medications, the antivirals that we use for hepatitis B, you'll also see uh, used for the treatment of HIV. And really the two uh, that you'll see in both are going to be tenofovir and lamivudine. Uh, there are two other drugs that are used for hepatitis B, and they're also reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Uh, those are entecavir and adefavir. Those don't really have that great of an effect on HIV, so we generally only are going to be using these for hepatitis B. So tenofovir is an NRTI, and the adverse effects are pretty minimal. It's nausea, vomiting, and malaise. Entecavir is only used in hepatitis B. Adverse effects here are also pretty minimal. Adefavir has some uh, problems with the kidneys. Uh, so it can cause hematuria. This is definitely something you want to avoid if you have a patient with hepatorenal syndrome, so patients who have enough cirrhosis, uh, maybe in the end stage of hepatitis B, you can get hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, you'll probably want to avoid a defavir in those patients because of its uh, known adverse effects to the kidneys. Lamivudine is also an NRTI, and this is also plays a big prominent role in HIV and AIDS therapy. Uh, adverse effects here are, again, relatively minimal, nausea, vomiting, malaise. Uh, you know, it's easy to say nausea, vomiting, malaise is minimal if you're not the patient, but really that's um, the only major side effects it causes commonly. Okay, uh, then another uh, medication that's used is pegasylated interferon alpha 2A, or you can just remember it as interferon alpha uh, for short. And... Remember that interferon is what your cells release when you have the flu. So pretty much your adverse effects are going to be a flu-like syndrome. So you can have myalgias uh, where you're just kind of touchy and achy. And uh, you can also get, uh, in, in some cases, you can get a leukopenia or an anemia. Uh, but for the most for the, for the most part, the adverse effects with interferon are just going to be that flu-like syndrome. And there's really, unfortunately, nothing you can do about it because that's what interferon does. As far as treating hepatitis C, so ribavirin and 
Interferon alpha 2A are the two drugs that are used, and ribavirin is the mainstay for hepatitis C. Before you prescribe ribavirin, you should ensure that any woman of childbearing age is not pregnant because ribavirin is extremely teratogenic. The adverse effects of ribavirin are hemolytic anemia, which can give rise to elevated bilirubin and jaundice and so forth. And then we talked about what interferon does. So as far as initiating therapy for hepatitis C, you should, uh, when the patient comes up positive for hepatitis C, you should start therapy with both ribavirin and interferon, treat them for six months, and then check for hepatitis C again. If they're negative for hepatitis C, then uh, they've cleared the disease. If they're positive, then they're actually diagnosed with chronic hepatitis C, and you're gonna continue to treat them with ribavirin and interferon. And there are also various protease inhibitors uh, that have been used in the treatment of uh, chronic hepatitis C, like favorans, but you don't need to know that. Just know ribavirin for hepatitis C along with interferon. And that's all.